Welcome everyone to this lecture on the significance of the thought of Isocrates and his legacy for us in education. You may recall that I mentioned Isocrates briefly in an earlier lecture on Plato's Meno, where I said that Isocrates wrote a defense speech for Anatus, one of Socrates' new accusers. In this speech, Isocrates held a um, held Anatus up as an exemplary and good man, as a democrat, and as one not at all prone to political vendettas. So much for Isocrates' abilities to judge a man's character, eh? Anyway, the passages you'll read from Isocrates in this class all come from a short fragmentary work entitled Against the Sophists. I want to pause here so that you understand what is meant by that title and by Isocrates when he uses that word sophist. Isocrates wrote this work early in his teaching career. It was a kind of attack on his competitors who, like him, had hung out their own shingle as teachers for hire. In what remains of his work, we see that Isocrates' enemies, therefore, are other teachers. They include not only real philosophers, but also other sophists who offered to bestow upon anyone who could pay the powers of speaking and persuasion. To keep things simple in your own mind, just remember that what Isocrates calls a philosopher is what he himself claims to be but that anyone else who does something different from him, including the genuine philosophers who came before him, he calls these men sophists. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it works well enough for our purposes in this course, and it has some support in the secondary literature as well. This oversimplification will also render clearly for you certain important things about Isocrates' approach to education and why his approach still resonates with us today. So who was this guy, this Isocrates guy anyway? I bet none of you have ever run across his name in your education philosophy or history of education textbooks. <clears throat> Isocrates? What's this steel guy saying? Is he stuttering? Maybe he thinks he's Socrates, and he's just speaking like caveman at us. I, Socrates, you student, that rock no hit head with rock hurt bad. What's going on? Let me clear things up for you. I, Socrates, wasn't Socrates, but he was a contemporary of Socrates, and he was from the same generation of Athenians as was Plato. Born into a wealthy family in 436 BC and schooled by some of the most renowned sophists, Isocrates lived during the time of the Peloponnesian War, that terrible civil war in which the Greeks were pitted most bloodily against one another, infighting and destroying each other pitilessly for dominance, and all largely because of Athens' voracious, acquisitive desires for always having more and more what Athens saw as its rightful place as leaders um, and as a ruler of all the other Greek states for what she took to be her God-given birthright. The Greek word for this insatiable thirst for more and more is pleonexia. Bit of an aside now. This voracious ambition for acquisition and glory is often pinpointed as the downfall of ancient Athens. One of the most notable ancient critics of Pleonexia was Herodotus. Many of you who are history buffs or who come to teacher training from a history degree will know him as the father of history. Briefly, Herodotus' uh, study of history taught him that nothing in this world lasts, that everything is subject to decay, 
and that even the oldest civilizations in the entire world, like the ancient Egypt was at the time, these were themselves subject to rise and fall. The only real constant Herodotus could ever find was tuke, which is the Greek word for luck or chance. But that's as much as to say that the only constant in life is change, eh? And that's pretty much what Herodotus meant, too. Like Brando playing Sky Masterson and Guys and Dolls, blowing on the dice and singing, Luck be a lady tonight. Herodotus also knew, as we all know, that sometimes Tuke is kind and ladylike, and sometimes she's on our side. But at other times, however, and just like Hamlet says ruefully, she's really at heart just a whore. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune, all you gods in general synod take away her power. Break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiends. Wow, snake eyes. Hamlet's sure not a good loser, eh? He forget, or actually he gets that image of Fortuna's wheel, by the way, from Herodotus, who writes, human life is like a revolving wheel, and never allows the same people to continue long in prosperity. Now, Herodotus wrote his great work, the Historiae, a title literally meaning inquiries, in order to investigate this unsettling problem of history. Namely, how luck never stays, how the ravages of time eat away at all things, and whether there is anything we can do about this mortal curse. Herodotus loved his Greek countrymen very much, I think. And he wanted to help them fare better against these seemingly unconquerable enemies of Tuche, of time, and decay. Throughout all of his impressive story gathering, his diverse traveling, and his adventures far and wide across the ancient world, Herodotus found one surefire way of screwing things up worse than they need to be. He found a way that always leads to disaster, or, at the very least, that speeds up the decay that's natural to the state of impermanent things and otherwise inherent under the influence of Tuke. This surefire way towards disaster is to indulge and to inflame one's own private desires for personal advantage, or to foster a society's pleonexic tendencies to whet its desire for more and more. Again, perhaps because I'm an old high school English teacher by trade, Herodotus's warnings against the corruptive force of Pleonexia remind me of Malcolm's test to Macduff's fealty in Shakespeare's Macbeth, where he feigns the admission of his own Pleonexia. With this there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a staunchless avarice that, were I king, I should cut off the nobles from their lands, desire his jewels, and this other's house, and my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. Such a sense of ravenous and bottomless Entitlement in Herodotus' view is the way that all foolish men are brought to their knees and that any society that grows too big on itself will come to eventual ruin. I strongly encourage each of you to pick up a copy of the histories of Herodotus. It's a pleasurable and exciting read full of stories that will help you understand Western society and our heritage of thought a bit better. And perhaps someday you'll find a different educational message in Herodotus than the one that I've enunciated for you here. But for now, I think one might safely say, when one reads all the wonderful stories and myths that Herodotus collects during his journeys and as part of his, his historiae, that he is warning readers to watch out for Pleonexia and that he's calling them towards moderation 
sound-mindedness, or sophrosyne. <clears throat> now that was a long digression on Herodotus, but the contrast it provides will help you when we get back on track thinking about Isocrates, and in particular, about how Isocrates doesn't think Pleonexia is such a bad thing after all. In his view, Pleonexia, or translated as seizing one's advantage, is only bad if it fractures and divides a people against itself. When Pleonexia isn't harnessed productively towards some grand collective pursuit. And indeed, such haphazard seizing of advantage was the driving force behind the Peloponnesian Civil War. Isocrates knew this, and he was all too aware of its dire consequences. From 431 to 404 BC, almost 30 years, this most terrible of wars ravaged the entire Greek populace. It eventually ended with the defeat of Athens during her grandiose failed Sicilian expedition. This defeat was soon after followed by Athens' surrender to the Spartans who had taken on Persian assistance. These events, in turn, led to the crumbling of all the Greek city-states, as well as to the rich political life that thrived in them. <clears throat> all of this war was to be replaced by... Ah, sorry. Um, all of this was to be replaced by uh, empiric Macedonian, Macedonian rule during the Hellenistic period um, by Philip of Macedon and later Alexander the Great. In other words, things in Isocrates' day were going down the crapper. Isocrates knew it and he wanted to help stop it. He saw his own family fortune fall apart during the Peloponnesian War. Out of necessity, he began earning his living as a courtroom speechwriter, or logographos, and then later as a teacher of composition for would-be orators and political men. Having set up a school of rhetoric on Chios, he later returned to his home city of Athens where he started a free school of what he called philosophy, although his use of that word bears no resemblance to what we have learned about philosophy in our investigations of Plato thus far in this course. Over and over in the extant works we have by Isocrates he refers to himself in glowingly patriotic terms. He portrays himself as a real lover of Athens, as somebody who wants to see Athens regain her place of glory and leadership. Isocrates is a genuine Hellenophile, or a lover of Das Volk. Indeed, at times, when I read him, I can't help but feel a little uneasy, in revulsion at the racial nature of his work. Everything Greek seems good to him. And everything barbarian? Not good. Mind you, Isocrates knows that the Greeks have only themselves to blame for the mess they're in, and he thinks um, what has happened to the Greek people is absolutely terrible. All this infighting and jealousy and hatred among them? I imagine him asking, Can you imagine what we Greeks would have accomplished if only we could have just got our collective act together. If we could just team up for a meaningful change and cooperate as a whole people. Athens would make a very fine leader for all the Hellenic peoples in Isocrates' eyes. In his Panegyricus, and using words not unlike those of Pericles in the funeral oration we have from Thucydides, Isocrates calls Athens the teacher of all the other Greek cities, about what it means to be Greek. Greekness isn't, in Isocrates' eyes, so much a racial characteristic as it is a state of mind that one develops through being properly educated. 
But the question we should ask here <clears throat> is what exactly is the state of mind that is engendered by Isocrates' vision of education in his Panhellenic ideal? Isocrates still thinks the Greeks can pull things out of the toilet. But they need someone like him to educate them. They need someone like Isocrates who, by teaching them the art of speaking, can give them the persuasive tools to rally together as Greeks around a common purpose. You might imagine Socrates saying, I Socrates saying, sorry, instead of working at cross purposes to flounder in the achievement of your fragmented, diverse, conflictual, individualized, or private goals, why not work together for a greater purpose, for a national or pan Hellenic purpose? If you really do want what you want, then let's go big through some effect, uh, some effective communication and cooperation. Let's scheme and get practical about how, given the goals we share, we can whoop all our enemies. We have a birthright to defend from the barbarian hordes, after all. Well, Isocrates proposed education for all of Greeks was all of Greece was therefore deeply practical. On the one hand, he was impatient with the false claims of his sophisticated competitors. He was deeply suspicious of anyone who spoke like a hired gun, like a Tony Robbins, a Deepak Chopra, or an Eckhart Tolle, guaranteeing uh, virtue to anyone who could pay charlatans all of them but he was likewise distrustful and impatient with any theoretical or contemplative pursuits like those of the genuine philosophers who seemed less hot about going out into the world to kick ass and take names but who voiced above all else their concern to know and to prepare within themselves the correct ordering of the soul and especially to seek out the ground of such an ordering. Nope. Unlike Plato and Socrates, what I Socrates wasn't uh, sought, what he sought wasn't to know the ordering of the soul or the ground of being, but rather to establish a unified nation under a Panhellenic ideal. Indeed, although I Socrates calls himself a philosopher. And although he deigns to have founded his own school of philosophy in Athens, when it comes down to it, Isocrates had zero interest in wisdom, in philosophy, or in pursuing the knowledge of what is highest and best, that ground of all goodness and justice, of all truth and beauty. To him, that was just a load of crap. In the Antidosis, a work he composed in his old age, and therefore much later than against the Sophist, the one you're reading, Isocrates writes scathingly, Since it is not in the nature of man to attain in a science by the possession of which we can know positively what we should do or what we should say, in the next resort, I hold that man to be wise who is able by his powers of conjecture to arrive generally at the best course. And I hold that man to be a philosopher who occupies himself with the studies from which he will most quickly gain that kind of insight. In, Socrates, er, in Isocrates' view, men can't know the highest truth of things. So we shouldn't bother trying. Men can't ever come to know the real meaning of what is truly pious or perfectly just or what is the ground of all goodness. Men may have desires and urges to know such things and it's okay for them to pursue such will-o'-the-wisps while they're young as a kind of game or trifling pursuit. Hell, there's even some value to learning how to dispute heuristically or dialectically about such things inasmuch as it will make you 
a good arguer later in life, which can be handy against an opponent in court, or when you're vying for a crowd um, against another orator. But, to make the genuine quest for wisdom one's life work, to make it the heart of one's deepest hopes, and to stake one's life on wisdom as what is most worthwhile, as that great good without which any other goods we might encounter, experience, or enjoy are rendered as not? This is sheer stupidity and madness in his view. Men who sought out such things, that is to say, true philosophers, were, in Isocrates' opinion, deeply deluded men. They were idiots, in the most true sense of that word. For our English word idiot is actually derived from the Greek word idiotes, which means a man who does not engage in public or political life, but is solely concerned with private matters as a private citizen. We might well imagine Isocrates saying in his accusations against such idiotic men something like the following. Well, surely any man who walks about all day looking for things that cannot be found anywhere in the real world of men, things like the meaning of justice and true virtue and the ground of all goodness, certainly such a man will get nowhere at all in political debates. And all that man's enemies will be able to get the better of him in worldly affairs, no doubt. Moreover, God forbid such a one gets hold of the children and youth to become their teacher. What a terrible botched mess an idiot philosopher like that will make out of our children. They'll screw him up so badly, they'll never amount to anything. Sure, he'll teach them the games of reasoning and dialectical wordplay. They'll maybe even sound like Socrates, able to tear down arguments and the like, but to what end? They'll never build anything. They'll never create anything. If any legacy is given to them by their forefathers, they'll squander it. And nothing will be left for future generations under such navel-gazers. These rotten, no-good loafers and so-called philosophers, these idiots, out with them all. Now, we can begin to see what Isocrates means by the so-called philosophic education that he proffers in his own school of philosophy, eh? Real philosophers, namely Isocrates himself and, oh yeah, himself, were all about pragmatics and getting her done. Any education worth its salt ought to teach a man not about his belly button, but how to govern wisely. It ought to, in Isocrates' words, assist us in governing both our own households and the commonwealth. And these matters alone should be the objects of our toil, our study, and our every act. Everything else is besides the point. Defending this vision of education as an old man in his antidosis, Isocrates writes against his competitors once again, and in favor of his own educational vision. This is what he says. If you compare me with those who profess to turn men to a life of temperance and justice, you will find that my teaching is more true and more profitable than theirs. For they exhort their followers to a kind of virtue and wisdom which is ignored by the rest of the world and is disputed among themselves. I, to a kind which is recognized by all. Put simply, the philosophers of old were spinning out yarns and wives' tales about wisdom with no solid footing in the real world. This is what Isocrates thinks, right? Isocrates' disdain for them reads very much like Dewey's attack upon all things philosophic when he chides, an ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. 
Therefore, if Isocrates is convincing to you, then discard your penchant and your drive for wisdom, ladies and gentlemen. This is Isocrates, the philosopher's deepest advice for you, as a would-be teacher who teaches responsibly and for the common good. Give up your heart of hearts, if that be wisdom, and get down to the more practical business of preparing students for the day when they shall have to run the economy. Create and foster the entrepreneurial spirit in your classroom. Help shape the minds who will one day produce the jobs, the goods, and the services that will keep the Chinese or whoever the new barbarian hordes may be off of our doorsteps. Secure the Albertan birthright against those foreign minions who would take it away from us. Learn to run your household your individual households, your own province, and your own nation in such a way as to secure your own advantage against a common enemy. Let Pleonexia be your guide rather than your ruin. This is precisely the message Isocrates has for us as modern educators. And this is precisely the vision that we have swallowed, hook, line, and sinker, in our public discussions and policy debates about education. Or at least, I'm going to make a case for that in what follows. But in order to follow me, you must not simply read your Isocrates. You must also take on the task of reading, as a case study, the Government of Alberta's 2010 Inspiring Education Report. This important document lays out the vision of our government overseers for the future of education and teaching in the province. It's good for you to read it in our class, as it will teach you about what the profile of a teacher in the 21st century is envisioned to be, and what you will be expected to be if you take on the job of the teacher. But even if you're not from Alberta, or if you're not planning to teach in Alberta, this document remains instructive. For it is good, it's a good representation of the sorts of things that are generally nowadays held up as innovative, progressive, and damn fine teaching. <clears throat> Once you've read the 2010 report, on the provincial, uh, from the Provincial Steering Committee, you'll begin to notice how certain statements, words, and phrases repeat continually. In particular, you may notice how frequently the committee calls its vision for the future of education in the province transformational. Kind of sounds funny to me personally. Anyone wandering around calling whatever they're doing transformational is worth being suspicious about, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, despite the contention of the committee that its vision is transformational, there is in fact nothing new or transformational about the contents of the inspiring education document so far as I can tell. Indeed, a little familiarity with the history of education, which you now have, shows that the ambitions and values espoused by Albertans and which drive the recommendations in the report are identical to those that drove achievement in schools during the time of Isocrates. These same ideas and aspirations have been simply carried down from his day well into today's times but with different language. I think that the sameness of the educational vision espoused by the steering committee in its discussions with ordinary Albertans on the one hand and the ancient sophistic education promoted by Socrates on the other hand is astounding really. For our purposes and in order that you might see the incredible similarity more plainly, let me here shift gears once again and introduce you to yet another author, St. Augustine, 
Bishop of Hippo, a very fine philosopher and a man of singular importance in church thought and history, seeing as his work set down Catholic doctrine for a thousand years or so. By looking to what Augustine has to say in his autobiographical work, The Confessions, perhaps the first great autobiography in Western literature, we'll be able to see just how well our own modern-day education system and even the so-called innovative and transformative values we suppose we have invented are really nothing new. And moreover, that these self-same values and innovations are of questionable value when exposed to the rigors and wonders of philosophic inquiry and questioning. In his Confessions, Augustine records his earliest memories of his experiences of school. He writes, But, O God, my God, I went through a period of suffering and humiliation. I was told that it was right and proper for me as a boy to pay attention to my teachers, so that I should do well at my study of grammar and get on in the world. This was the way to gain the respect of others and win for myself what passes for wealth in this world. Foremost even in Augustine's day was the societal and parental hope and expectation that children attending school would, by doing so, be trained for success in worldly affairs. Modern Alberta, Isocrates' war-ravaged Greece, ancient Rome, or 3rd century Thagast are not much different in this regard. Mind you, in Augustine's day, teachers were a rather brutal lot, administering frequent beatings to their charges at the behest of parents, in order that students might take their schoolwork all the more seriously. Augustine remarks that, Parents scoffed at the torments which we boys suffered at the hands of our masters. In this regard, he's critical of both teachers and parents for the hypocrisy of their harshness towards children. He writes, We sinned by reading and writing and studying less than was expected of us. We lacked neither memory nor intelligence because by your will, O Lord, we had as much of both as was sufficient for our years. But we enjoyed playing games, and were punished for them by men who played games themselves. However, grown-up games are known as business, or negotia. Note the powerful way that Latin contrasts business, negotium, with leisure, or otium. The business of chasing after worldly success, as delineated by Augustine, is a kind of play that negates our participation in scale, otium, or leisure. But leisure, as we have seen in earlier lectures, is the precise spiritual activity and requisite atmosphere that renders possible all noetic, contemplative, or philosophic activity. In the passage above, Augustine views the education he received at the hands of his schoolmasters, the type demanded for him by his father, and the type demanded to this day by parents in Alberta and everywhere else, as nothing more than preparation for the trifling games of adults in the world of success and achievement, of work and business or negotium. He wonders at how such an education was treated as though it were something of grave seriousness. So serious, in fact, that it warranted such brutal beatings from his teachers, when in fact, the worldly affairs of adults were no better than the childhood games sought out by Augustine and the other boys on pain of the whip. As a philosopher looking back on his childhood, Augustine is concerned with the pursuit of wisdom. That is, he doesn't seek out the lesser goods of wealth, notoriety, and power, 
which parents even today want most for their children, and as much as they suppose that success in these things will bring their children happiness. Rather, as a philosopher, Augustine's concern is to know, to see, and to love the highest good. It is for this reason that he describes the worldly ambitions that parents and teachers pursue and that they foist upon children as frivolous diversions. He judges such pursuits to be trifling games masquerading as what is of utmost importance. And he views any education that promotes these things as truly worthy of seriousness as a corruption of a true education that would lead human beings to their highest and most real happiness. Augustine is principally critical of the education he received and that his father demanded for him on the grounds that it didn't teach him to know himself. It didn't engage him in self-reflection or introspection. He writes, What can be more pitiful than an unhappy wretch unaware of his own sorry state? Rather than teach him to know his own heart and that You, O God, are the light of my heart. It taught him instead to love the world. Indeed, the purpose of schools uh, that is broadly acknowledged by parents, school administrators, teachers, and government overseers, whether 1,600 years ago in Thagast or in modern-day Alberta, is to assure the worldly success of their students. And who today would seriously argue with this ambition? But Augustine puts the matter quite starkly. He writes, Human children are pitched into this hellish torrent together with the fees which are paid to have them taught lessons like these. The roar of public debates surrounding education, which Augustine likens to the sound of boulders crashing against one another, has always been Uh, to provide parents and students with schools most capable of bringing success to those attending. Effectively, schools must be made to compete with one another, as must both parents and students vie against one another for attendance at their specific school of choice. In this same vein, the Alberta educational system is particularly praised in a 2006 edition of The Economist for its promotion of school choice through its charter system. Even today, schools must market themselves to the ambitions and hopes of parents by saying, This is the school where men are made masters of words. This is where they learn the art of persuasion so necessary in business and debate. That's a little quote taken from Augustine. And what is most horrible about such a system of instruction and ambition, according to Augustine, is that it rewards students who buy in to the status quo view that these goods are most serious rather than trifling games. Augustine writes, If we refuse to drink as students from what he calls the wine of error, then we were beaten for it. Hence, in order to avoid beatings, And in order that he might be praised by his teachers, his peers, and his family, the young schoolboy Augustine found himself delighting in the prospect of buying in. He writes, It is true that I learned all these things gladly and took a sinful pleasure in them. And for this very reason I was called a promising boy. Indeed, According to all the measures and assessments of his teachers, his peers, and his family, Augustine was a brilliant student at the top of his class. But on his own assessment later in life, from the standpoint of the philosopher, and as one who would live to see the vanity of all of his worldly ambitions, Augustine confesses, Let me tell you, my God, how I squandered the brains you gave me on foolish delusions. In short, the education sought by parents even today 
and chased after even by the most excellent students, who is sent to the status quo ambitions of their society, whether it be Isocrates, Greece, ancient Thagast, or modern Alberta, is delusional from Augustine's perspective. Such an education is a terrible waste of childhood and intellect. It's certainly not transformational. By investigating the spirit of current educational reforms across Alberta in light of their similarity to mass attitudes towards education even in ancient societies, we come to see just how out of place and unwanted the spirit of philosophy as a way of life must be in any educational system. Parents today, like parents in Augustine's day, want teachers who will guarantee that their children will be made successful in worldly affairs, that they will be able to achieve the goals of their passions and their desires, and by doing so become happy. In Augustine's day, such purveyors of success were called sophists, literally wise men. Briefly, and as a recap from earlier lectures where we have discussed such things already, the character of the sophist came to prominence in Greek educational circles once the contention that virtue was the sole possession of an aristocratic uh, bloodline as their exclusive birthright came into question among the people or the demos. And when the citizens of the city began to look for a method of educating their sons into a new citizen ideal. A new democratic desire began to grow in the polis or the city, that all of its citizens should have a wider intellectual education. And the sophists rose up in response to this desire, particularly as it became manifest among the more wealthy citizens who were not part of the aristocracy, but who nevertheless wanted their sons to be trained in political virtue, that they might become successful leaders in their respective cities. <coughs> in his classic work on education, Werner Jaeger uh, points to the notion that virtue can be taught as the origin of sophistic instruction, when he writes in his seminal work on education that a class of educators arose who publicly professed that in return for money they would teach virtue to whoever could pay for it, in an Athens where now more than ever before the end of life was achievement, success. We've already examined this claim and how Plato deals with it in his Mino. And so we will not revisit that line of inquiry here. But we need to acknowledge that this same desire for an education in success continues to be foundational in modern day public education. With the main difference being that the democratic ideal of an education for successful citizenship is no longer thought to be the sole prerogative of a select few among the citizenry who can pay for it. Rather, in modern times, this notion of education and its demand for success has grown ubiquitous among democratic populaces. In short, no longer is virtue held to be the hereditary trait of an aristocratic elite, nor ought it be available only to the richest among the citizenry. Such an education for success is now considered to be the birthright of every citizen in a democratic state. Indeed, the inspiring education document states this fundamental belief in our birthright quite emphatically. You can look on page 4. There it is. Our modern schools, whether or not they are reformed by the inspiring education document, are modeled upon the teacher as sophist rather than upon the genuine philosophic spirit of the academy. Jaeger remarks that the sophists have, uh, have been described as the founders of educational science. They did indeed found pedagogy. 
Even today, intellectual culture largely follows the path they marked out. Indeed, in many ways, we do not begin to feel at home in Greece until the rise of the Sophists. Just as the ancient Greeks turned to the Sophists to ensure the success of their own sons, so too is the modern school system concerned with the same thing, except on a massive democratic scale of service delivery, where it too concerns most efficiently and effectively um, delivering the educational means towards the goods and services, the hopes, dreams, and passions of those in attendance. <clears throat> now Augustine loved success and acclaim as a student and as a teacher. It's not surprising then that being at the top of his school in rhetoric, he found himself associating with sophists, known, known widely at the time as the Wreckers. I always imagine them having leather jackets that say, The Wreckers. Anyway, these Wreckers were wandering mostly foreign teachers for a large... Um, they, they were these foreign teachers who, for a large sum of money, would guarantee to fathers any sort of success that they sought for their sons. Unlike the mathematician, the craftsman, or the expert horseman, for instance, who had a kind of wisdom in his narrow field of endeavor and who could, by extension, teach his knowledge to his students, the sophist claimed a basic disinterest in such matters, instead purporting to possess, possess a more compelling um, and potent wisdom that might secure more attractive goods of wealth, prestige, and power for his students. The ancient sophist Protagoras, for instance, was anxious to distinguish his own sophistic art from all the other professions that are technical in a narrower sense. He sharply differentiated his ideal of a universal education from purely factual instruction, which, in his opinion, ruined young men. <laughs> that sounds familiar today, doesn't it? Rather than instruct his students about any specific knowledge in a particular discipline or area of inquiry, Protagoras purported to teach his students political virtue that did not rely on such lowly technical instruction, but transcended it completely. So it's tempting to see a parallel between the contention of Protagoras that the teacher sophist need not be an authority in any particular field of knowledge in order to teach for success on the one hand, and the committee's uh, report, its 2010 claim, on the other hand, that less emphasis must be placed on knowing something and more on knowing how to access information about it. That's a direct quote. <clears throat> the resemblance between these two claims at this level is superficial. For the modern teacher, though no longer envisioned as an authority in his or her field of study, is nonetheless still concerned with specific instruction in a specific discipline. Now, however, the 21st century teacher is commanded by the committee to rely upon the memory of technologically constructed data banks rather than his or her own faculty of remembering. By contrast, Protagoras eschews all interest in these more technical areas of learning in favor of expounding upon his higher wisdom. Uh, in particular, he presumes to inculcate in any student the virtue of knowing how best to order his home and to have most influence in public affairs, both in speech and in action. Nonetheless, the resonance of education today with ancient Protagorean sophistry remains at a deeper level inasmuch as the claim to teach uh, for the successful attainment of happiness is at the heart of both schemes. Today's teachers uh, still instruct in the disciplines that are said by Protagoras to maltreat the young, but 
contemporary educational systems do so with the belief that knowledge of what is taught in these studies, the wisdom of achieving mandated outcomes, will result in greater potential for success and happiness. Knowledge of worldly things is mistakenly understood in both the modern and the ancient sophistic education systems as virtue, as the means to acquire a higher happiness. Among ancient sophists, the wisdom or virtue that was taught concerned effective speaking in order to attain one's deepest desires. In contemporary educational circles, the promise of real-time access to all the world's wisdom for the purposes of attaining success through constant innovation is made available by means of modern information technology. Whether ancient or modern, all sophistic education promises to render unto its students the means to attain the multitudinous objects of their desires. Put another way, all sophistic education, be it ancient or modern, is designed to gratify and to encourage the pleonexia of students. Indeed, the gratification of pleonexia is taught as a basic virtue in such an education, and its power is understood as the essential means to happiness. And remember, just to remind you, pleonexia means taking your own advantage, right? Getting what you want, having more, acquiring. Augustine critiques all such sophistry-based education for its pride and its conceit. Remembering his time among the wreckers, he records that his affinity with these sophists rested in his own pleasure at his superior status. He recognized that like these men he was swollen with conceit. The sophists' aggrandizement of, or pride uh, arises from his presupposition that he is wise. And the word for pride back then in Latin was superbia. Superbia is the distinguishing feature that marks off the sophist from the philosopher. For the philosopher, as a lover of wisdom, knows that he lacks wisdom. In contrast to the philosopher's knowledge of his own ignorance, something we've already discussed during our reading of Plato's Apology, the sophist's conceit uh, causes him to misconstrue the nature and extent of his knowledge. He identifies his knowledge with knowing the highest things. He claims that he possesses knowledge of the means to happiness, and moreover that he can teach this knowledge to his students. In short, the conceit of the sophist lies in supposing that his knowledge, certainly useful in the realms of business and politics, and in attaining the objects of personal ambition, is truly wisdom when it's not. Similar to Augustine, Joseph Pieper has remarked poignantly on the self-centeredness that distinguishes the sophist from the philosopher. Pieper writes, The difference consists in this. The true philosopher thoroughly oblivious of his own importance and totally discarding all pretentiousness approaches his unfathomable object, namely wisdom, unselfishly and with an open mind. The contemplation of this object, in turn, transports the subject beyond mere self-centered satisfaction and indeed releases him from the fixation on selfish needs no matter how intellectual or sublime. The sophist, in contrast, despite his emancipation from the norms of objective truth and the resulting claims to be free, remains nevertheless imprisoned within the narrow scope of what is usable, precisely because he chases after novelty and desperately, obsessively, tries to affect surprise by thought 
and expression, and thus to contribute to a certain form of higher entertainment. Wherever such selfishness dominates the existential arena, there we should not expect true philosophy to flourish, if it can come about at all. Now, building upon Augustine's critique of our educational heritage, Pieper points out that the selfish conceit of the sophist lies in his narrow concern with what is usable, with what can bring him success or acclaim. He seeks what contributes to his undying pursuit of novelty, or, as the Standing Committee describes it, his need for continuous innovation. Such an education is described as selfish because it has as its objective the gratification of the multifarious desires and passions for the fluctuating things of this world, as opposed to a genuine desire for the unchanging, eternal truth that the philosopher pursues as wisdom. Within such an existential arena, and in our study, this arena is the education system, Pieper doubts that true philosophy could flourish, that it could ever come about at all. Following Pieper's observations in this regard, and given the, sophistic foundation, given the sophistic foundation of our own society's hopes in the education that it proffers to its youth, we're led to wonder whether the genuine pursuit of wisdom could ever realistically be part of education today or in the future. Pieper's insights about the antagonism between the pursuit of wisdom and sophistry can be carried fruitfully into the realm of education philosophy. He makes the conflict between philosophic inquiry and an education grounded in the sophistic drive for what is usable to bring about success, accountability, and preconceived outcomes even more clear in his definition of wisdom's pursuit or what it means to philosophize. He writes, What does it mean to philosophize? Philosophizing means precisely this. To experience that the proximate environment corresponding to the workday of everyday life, which is governed by the immediate necessities of life, can be disrupted time and again by the disquieting interjection of the world, of reality as a whole. The act of philosophizing consists in taking the step from the cross-sectional milieu of the workday world in the vis-a-vis the l'univers. It is a step that leads to a state of unhousedness. So what he means is philosophy disrupts productivity, essentially. It renders uncertain the value of the achievement of those seeking accountability in education for predetermined government-mandated outcomes. It unhouses us from our workday existence, and it calls into a question the pursuit of all the successes expected of our children by the current educational system. In our system of education, the philosopher, whether a teacher or a student, necessarily becomes a misfit. Pieper writes, the philosopher will not fit naively into the functioning of the workday uh, routine. He is well, will not be fit for this world. He is well will look at things differently from those who primarily are dominated by the pursuit of practical purposes. This discrepancy, this incommensurability, can, so it seems, never be eliminated. It has always been with us, and there is quite some evidence that it is becoming ever more acute. Indeed, Plato makes clear this conflict between the ordinary worldly ambitions of most people for a successful life on the one hand, and the philosopher's love of wisdom on the other hand when he describes philosophy in the, in the Phaedo as the art of dying rather than as the art of living. 
derisive laughter has since time immemorial been heaped upon the philosopher for his ridiculous appearance. And Plato has Socrates remark in his Theatetus that anyone who gives his life to philosophy is open to such mockery. Indeed, the vision of education praised by the committee in its esteem for uh, relevance renders the figure of the philosopher as well as the exhortation in this paper um, towards a noetic education ever more irrelevant, if not socially irresponsible and repugnant to the conscience of progressive educators keen on making the world a better place. All the more and with full force does its irrelevance come to the fore as soon as philosophy is contrasted with the principles and hidden drives of the modern world of production. And if we, con if, if we call to mind that we are confronted not by accident after all with new and acute challenges to our very existence, then we might easily waver somewhat in our defense of philosophy. Not only does the fight against hunger compel us to employ ever more intensive techniques for the exploitation of all available resources, the preservation of freedom as well, in this world divided and overshadowed by competing powers, seems to demand that all our energies be put in place, and rightly so. How can it be justified, then, to insist that it is essential for a truly humane existence to keep present and to confront the question as to the ultimate and fundamental meaning of all that is, in short, to philosophize? In asking questions of no practical utility, as, why is there something rather than nothing, the incommensurability of, of wisdom's pursuit with the workday world of usefulness and serviceability is brought to the fore. Pieper asks rhetorically, if this question were uttered quite unexpectedly and without any form of explanation among achievement and success-oriented people, would the questioner not be thought a madman? In his view, as soon as one seeks wisdom, a step has been taken that transcends the world of work and leads beyond it. The genuine philosophical question pierces through the dome that encloses the world of the bourgeois workday. That's a quote from Pieper as well. Now to draw all this back specifically to Isocrates and his value um, in our understanding of ourselves and the manner of educating. <clears throat> Practical-minded educators have long criticized philosophy on the grounds of its ineptitude in practical things like education. Indeed, there's a good deal of truth to Josef Pieper's statement that whoever undertakes to live the life of the philosopher will have to prepare himself for the fact that he might someday lose his bearings in the workday world, and that the person for whom everything encountered has become a wonder may sooner or later forget how to wield those very same things that he encounters on an everyday basis. This being the case, philosophy's critique of sophistic education, as you have learned about it already in our investigations of Plato's Mino and the Apology, has, since its first utterance, been met with the rejoinder that the philosopher's alternative to sophistry would mean the stultification of action, of innovation and achievement, and therefore the subsequent destruction of civilization. Philosophy would wreck everything. Perhaps the best known example of the sophist's rebuttal to the philosopher's criticisms is the response of Isocrates. Again, a pupil of Protagoras, Prodicus, and especially of Gorgias, Isocrates has been recognized by generations of classical scholars and historians as the true father of humanistic culture and as the founder of our modern liberal arts education system. Like Gorgias, throughout his life, Isocrates aimed at teaching the art of rhetoric, 
However, as was said earlier, Isocrates preferred to apply the title sophist only to philosophers, and his own ideal he called philosophy. Thus he completely inverted the meanings given by Plato to the two words, while maintaining the negative connotation of the term sophist and the positive connotation of philosopher. Put simply, the philosopher or the genuine lover of wisdom was the real sophist, and the sophist, namely Socrates himself, was the real philosopher. In Isocrates' view, the philosophers, namely Plato and the Socratics, were the true sophists because their educational project of disputation and dialectic, their ostensible yearning for truth and order in the soul, could only stultify decisive and effective political action in the world by rendering it problematic, rather than promote a unified Greek nation under Athens that could protect itself from its enemies. To this day, following Isocrates, the spirit of philosophy, which calls into question the sophistic pursuit of the worldly of worldly goals and ambitions, is deemed unrealistic, impractical, and dangerous to both public order and prosperity. Whereas a philosophic education might be fine for men not concerned with politics, private men, Isocrates' teaching um, teachings are meant for the whole pu- pol- that the whole polis, right? Whereas again, like philosophy is basically for idiots, right? But Isocrates' teaching that's for everybody. That's for people who want to get things done. As teacher, he tries to persuade his fellow students to understand enterprises, or rather undertake enterprises which will make themselves happy and free the rest of the Greeks from their present troubles. Right? It's very practical. The philosophic urge must therefore be quelled, not only in the name of the individual worldly success is guaranteed by the sophistic education of his predecessors, but in order to safeguard more civic-minded concerns for the survival of the public good against hostile neighbors and competitors for power as voiced by Socrates. Noetic studies like philosophy, rather than applying first principles downward into the world of practical doings, makings, application and mastery of the world, instead take up these principles towards their beginning. As such, philosophic or theoretical pursuits have always been criticized as time pissed away, as abstraction writ large, as impeding worldly success, uh, thwarting ambition and jeopardizing security. Moreover, when the choice is given between philosophy and sophistry, the historical results are less than heartening for the philosopher. As James Moyer remarks in his survey of scholarship on the history of education, on the level of history, Plato has been defeated. He points out that it was Isocrates who defeated him, and who became the educator first of Greece, and subsequently of the whole of the ancient world. I have had you read Isocrates, and I wanted you to learn a little bit about him, ladies and gentlemen, not to depress you, or to turn you away from philosophizing as teachers. Any of you who know me in the least know that I treasure the chance to philosophize with students, and that I'm trying my best to live philosophy as a way of life, rather than as a kind of mental gymnastic or theoretized book learning. I very much value the philosophic spirit in teaching and learning, and I hope that some of you do as well. I also hope that this course of study is helping you think a bit more, uh, a bit more clearly about the meaning of philosophy, its role in your life, and how wonderfully the pursuit of wisdom might enter into your daily work as a teacher who feels called to live the teacher's life genuinely. 
that is, as one who tries his or her best to embody both the active and contemplative lives. That being said, I also offer this lecture on Isocrates to you as a kind of friendly warning. I want you to see that being a philosopher in schools can be a dangerous thing. It's not all rainbows and unicorns like it's sometimes portrayed by professional philosophers and philosophers of education or by people who start things they call philosophy programs in their schools. In many ways, you can see that the genuine spirit of philosophy is an unwelcome thing. The odds are against you as they were against Plato, and they're most certainly with the sophists. And if you philosophize, you will encounter much resistance. I state this as a simple fact of experience that you will learn if you take this route. I want you, in other words, to go into things that matter so deeply with your eyes wide open and with a good knowledge of what you might be getting yourself into. That being said, if you do harbor a secret love of wisdom in your heart, this is a great gift for you as well as for your students. You'll suffer certainly, and you'll suffer in ways and in about things that folks who do not philosophize do not suffer. But you'll also do much good as a teacher who pursues wisdom, and as one who invites others to philosophize. And remember, not all suffering is bad after all. Plato's image of the man ascending out of the cave into the light of day is also the image of a man in pain. For eyes accustomed to darkness experience sunlight painfully. There is suffering involved any time we see the beautiful. I wish you well.